Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Pichai Chun Suksawat uh, of the Bangkok Post. I have the honor of being your moderator this morning. But before we start the session, I would like to invite Mr. Borge Brende, the Managing Director, uh, Government Relations and Constituents Engagement of the World Economic Forum, to please come to the stage to uh, give some introduction remarks. Thank you, please. Thank you. Good morning, Excellencies. And also, I would like to address our special guest, Doan San Sushi, being here with us. Heartly welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Phil, from the response and the applause. How oh, much appreciated your first visit outside Burma in 24 years uh, is. Ladies and gentlemen, also a warm welcome uh, to all of you to the World Economic Forum on East Asia. This is the 21st East Asia meeting that is convened at the time when the region is witnessing great transformation and is at a crucial point on its journey to realizing the tremendous economic and political potential. As you all know, the 10 member states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, have a combined population of more than 600 million people. If ASEAN were one nation, it would be the ninth largest economy in the world. This is an ASEAN light years away from the ASEAN one faced even at our inception meeting on East Asia 21 years ago. As an illustration, the ASEAN Tigers have increased their annual export from 5 billion US dollars annually in 1960s to seven, more than 700 billion US dollars today. Hence, export has increased by more than 150 times. The return of Asia to the world stage will define this century. The region's growth rate is expected to exceed 5% in 2012, despite ongoing economic turmoil in the Eurozone, in the US, and also more sluggish growth in China. Our aspiration at this meeting, convened under the team, shaping the region's future through connectivity, is to address the current challenges in a proactive manner and avoid a situation of increased protectionism. I think the panel will also address these issues. The ASEAN's declared goal of creating a single market by 2015 should be an inspiration for the rest of the world and will definitely create additional economic growth and also jobs for the young population of this part of the world. In many of the countries in ASEAN, more than 50% of the population is under the age of 20. And just imagine how many jobs that have to be created in the coming years to also address this youth bulge. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Located at the heart of the region and representing East Asia's second largest economy, Thailand is a logical choice for the meeting and an ideal location for us to discuss how the region's future opportunities can be developed sustainably. The best wishes for the two coming days and for a very successful meeting. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Brende, for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we now uh, start the opening panel discussion. Now, we all know that in the uh, past decade or so, the global economy uh, continues to be affected uh, by challenges from one crisis to another. And in recent years, the world's uh, largest uh, economies have slowed and question marks remain over the future of the uh, EU, but although how remote, there's still a question mark in the cloud. And all these recent developments affect us here, affects the world. And this brings us to the topic of this panel discussion. What is the role of East Asia in this current landscape? What's the role of East Asia in transforming uh, the global economy? How can East Asia contribute to global economic rebalancing and growth? What are the challenges, responsibilities, and obligations of the region and Asia's current and future role in global trade, financial systems, and issues like climate change? Now, the WEF has assembled this morning an esteemed panel to address these issues. And uh, be, we'd like this panel discussion to be a conversation among the panelists themselves and amongst you out there, the audience. Now, we won't start with the usual introduction of the panel discussion, but as a courtesy, I really think we should. I will introduce each of the panelists without going through their biographies. After that, they won't be making a long presentation, but they'll be making some opening comments. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, from my immediate left, you will know most of these people may I introduce, uh, and if you could, hold your applause until at the end of all five people. Uh, Director General of the World Trade Organization, Pascal Lamy, who in his immediate left, Pakita Wejawan, the Minister of Trade of Indonesia. To his left, Thailand's Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, Kun Kitirat Natranong. Next to him is Mr. Gerard Mistralé, Chairman and Executive Officer of GDF Suez of France and the Co-Chair of the World Economic Forum on East Asia. Last, ladies and gentlemen, but not least, is Mr. Eshwar Prasad, Professor from Cornell University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the panel. <laughs> Let's start with the man on my immediate left. Uh, he's a man who recently likes Bob Dylan, and he will be talking about change. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lamy will give us, I think, a global perspective of how he sees East Asia's role, if he may, in the current economic climate, and also the role of trade and open borders and looking to the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamy. Well, thank you. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, if we look, uh, if I look at um, East Asia uh, from the WTO side, this region has been doing uh, better than the rest of the world during the crisis. Overall, the growth in this region has not been seriously damaged by the crisis so far. But this region is growingly uh, interlinked, interconnected with the rest of the planet, and I don't think this relative immunity uh, will uh, be forever. So I would expect, given what's happening in other parts of the world economy, uh, this region to be uh, more affected in the two, three years to come than it has been so far. When you look at the rest of the world, Obviously, uh, Europe is not doing well, uh, seriously slowing down. Uh, US uh, still has to uh, address its uh, own debt problem. Uh, not for now, but probably for later. Uh, China, as we know, is slowing down, and it's not the relative high growth of Africa that can compensate for that. So overall, the rest of the world uh, slowing down will uh, impact this region. If I look at trade, uh, volume of world trade last year plus 5%, uh, volume of trade within this region last year plus 7%. Yes. Volume of world trade this year probably less than 4%, so I expect 
something within this region, sort of 5.5%, uh, which is, again, clearly on the downside. Now, the biggest risk, <coughs> we all know, uh, is uh, especially for the, because of the intensity of the trade relationship of this region with the rest of the world, its huge insertion and importance in global supply chains, the main risk is protectionism. And uh, we know that this remains a serious risk. A growing risk. We, in the WTO, will probably uh, publish today the radar picture which we publish regularly, uh, which will show <coughs> that during the last six months, protectionist pressures have intensified, but more worryingly, uh, protectionist actions have intensified. So more and more governments are now ceding to these pressures, and uh, what had damaged uh, two years ago sort of 1% of world trade, which was not very significant, is probably uh, now to the tune of 3% of world trade, which is a level which becomes really worrying. And the most worrying is that it's, it's an accumulation of small measures, but which do not disappear. Huh? It's like a bad cholesterol. Huh? You get it progressively until a moment uh, where uh, the pipe doesn't work anymore. So that's for this region, which is especially exposed to the vibrancy of international trade. That's risk, uh, the main risk. The main uh, action, uh, I think, uh, is uh, ongoing, has been ongoing for many years now, which is ASEAN integration. If you look at the map of the world, uh, integration, regional integration is, let's say, all over the place, yes. but more or less successfully. Uh, there are three regions which, let's say, for the last five years have increased, achieved, moment, achieved results, increased momentum, ASEAN, Central America, and uh, East Africa. The rest is clearly uh, lagging behind, uh, not to speak about regional integration processes which were in good shape five years ago and which now are in very bad shape, such as uh, Mercosur or the Andean community, for instance. So that's a very strong comparative advantage of this region. Uh, more to come, and my own sense is that the more they integrate, and they do that pragmatically, day by day, month by month, year by year, the more they do that, the more resilience they will build mm -hmm. to uh, external shocks, uh, which again, uh, I believe, are going to be with us for a long time. Thank you, Mr. Lamy. So, two issues there. ASEAN is at risk, may be affected, and ASEAN integration. If I may ask the Deputy Prime Minister, Punkiti Rat, to take care of his observations on how he sees the region's role given the current landscape outlined by Mr. Lamy. Well, uh, <clears throat> I have to be careful saying this in front of the uh, Secretary General of the WTO, but I um, want to be you know, straight and honest in what I do believe. I think um, it will take, uh, still take a while before uh, the um, member economies, member countries in the WTO can have um, the so-called consensus among ourselves in a single undertaking at the Doha round that the WTO um, has been working on. And uh, I'm optimistic that uh, someday, not too immediately, not too soon, that uh, all of us can uh, achieve the consensus. However, uh, during these uh, days, the um, economies around the world will be somewhat under pressure to try to do things to, uh, of course, improve the potential growth, to try to achieve the stability, 
And hopefully, um, many of us already realize that it's not only uh, growth and stability, but also distribution of wealth. Then uh, we will be seeing uh, the world uh, trying to form into certain um, economic zone, economic community. Not, again, not because we don't believe in the, the uh, multilateral relationship at the WTO. But then uh, it would be you know, a good, good discussion. I'm sure that uh, Mr. Lamy will discuss that with us in another round. Um, East Asia, Southeast Asia, in the past, uh, we've been um, for too long, I think, you know, trying to concentrate on uh, being export-led growth and then forget the fact that uh, we have room for improvement in our own economies. And I just said, our own economy means that within our economy, each economy, and also among uh, different economies within the region, that if we improve the productivity, efficiency, uh, purchasing power within our own economies, we can also uh, serve ourselves uh, better, and then the growth will be easier achieved. And also, we can help uh, balance the, the world, because um, in the past, when we try to export more, and the West uh, would, of course, be the market, they import more, so surplus are here, deficits are there, and that's not very ideal in terms of uh, the sustainable growth, in terms of uh, the balancing uh, economies. And what I'm, I'm seeing is that uh, I'm seeing the countries in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, working uh, to improve uh, our own um, purchasing power by uh, improving the um, income of those lower income groups, whether both uh, in the urban area, also in the agricultural sector. And by doing so, um, we can uh, be uh, better self-contained. We can be um, better uh, members within <clears throat> the region in such a way that we can <clears throat> not only try to export more, but we can import more from our uh, friends from all over the world too. But uh, um, yesterday I had a discussion uh, at another panel and I mentioned that uh, what are we trying to do today is to um, facilitate trade. We try to eliminate uh, barriers. And there are so many items that we have got to uh, talk about from the custom tariff reduction to uh, credit uh, facilities availability, including the uh, logistic and connectivity, which is the, the topic today. If we try to improve the logistics system in such a way that the cost of transportation uh, would be the lowest possible, that would help facilitate trading uh, um, between the, uh, countries and among the countries too. So what I believe that will be happening, especially in this part of the world, is that we'll try to improve the logistic connectivity uh, among ourselves in order to uh, better facilitate trade, in order that the uh, abundant resources from different economies can exchange, and that's uh, the way uh, we will uh, you know, work hard to see the growth. Of course, there are so many items from uh, the area that you um, uh, mentioned in this morning about the you know, corruption, transparency, governance, uh, environment, social. But then uh, I think the most important uh, uh, policy that uh, these countries in the region should try to improve together is the so-called uh, connectivity in order to uh, reduce the uh, cost or reduce the barrier. That's what I'd like to touch in the first round. Pakita, if you could elaborate on your thoughts there, please. Thank you, Pichai. <clears throat> if we take a look at the last decade, I think China has been a big part of the equation of growth in Asia, then later on India, then ASEAN. China has been consuming, on average, 30 to 40 percent of the global commodities every year in the last decade when we know that they represent only 10% of the global GDP, then that disconnect at some point has got to get corrected. Mm -hmm. If not, it has to be compensated by the growth in other leading <coughs> developing economies, such as Brazil, India, Russia, South Africa, and ASEAN. I don't think it's enough 
to make up for whatever recalibration of the consumption of commodities. Then on top of all this, what we're seeing in European economies, there seems to be this sense of kicking the can down the road, uh, prolonging the pain yeah. or the gain or what have you. All this, I think, will have some repercussions on prices of commodities. Oil price, we've seen declining. And let's not forget that you know, the actual supply and demand was only 70 to 80 million barrels, but we know the transactions over the markets is about 2 billion barrels per day. If this were to get corrected by more oversight on speculative nature transactions on commodities, then I think we may see further declination of commodities prices, which I think will have pretty direct, if not indirect, effect on countries like Indonesia, which is blessed with a lot of commodities. So the thinking of policymakers in countries like Indonesia is, okay, we're quite likely not to be able to export as many or as much stuff that we've been able to do in the last few years. So the way to do that is, or the way around that is to focus on more value added. And I think that's the stuff that we've been trying to do. We've been trying to climb up the value chain. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, lies on the back of a very poor, if not somewhat behind soft infrastructure that, you know, we should have built a lot more in the last 20, 30 years, but we didn't. But now we have the fiscal space to do it. You know, our debt to GDP ratio at 24% on a continuing declination to less than 20% in the next two to three years, and our ability to manage inflation and our demographic dividends. All these, with the right view taking on investing and education, that will allow us to climb up the value chain, I think will help us reconfigure our economic structure so that we can stay on course. We're also blessed by the fact that a good chunk of our GDP is related to domestic consumption, right. unlike other exporting nations in Southeast Asia or East Asia. 60% of the GDP is related to domestic consumption, whereas exports only made up 26% of the GDP. So I think we're a little bit different structurally, but we are cognizant of what we have to do to make sure that we stay the course in terms of undertaking this inclusive and sustainable growth trajectory. But if we take a look at ASEAN as a whole, I think intra-ASEAN economic activities have gone up yes. significantly. This is, I think, what will keep us you know, somewhat unscathed from the externalities that we may be seeing in the years to come, like what we might have seen in other parts of the world, in Europe and the US. I want to touch on the Deputy Prime Minister's reference to multilateralism. We are complete believers of the principle of single undertaking as how we have conveyed our aspirations to the WTO and to the rest of the world through the WTO. But I think it becomes a little more difficult when recoveries in some places may take time. Some may take longer than others. When stuff like that occurs, there is a natural tendency to regionalize cooperation as opposed to multilateralize cooperation. Mm -hmm. But as long as we are believers of the fact that this will be complementary to the spirit of multilateralism and single undertaking, you know, the question is always about whether or not we're patient enough to do it. You know, for a country like Indonesia that was battered 14 years ago, getting ourselves to where we are now, I think 14 years is not that bad. I know some people in this room who waited longer than that. 
I think if we stay patient, we will be able to strike a successful completion of the Doha round. Okay, thank you. Mr. 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 Ali, please, if I could have your views, your assessment based on the discussions so far. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very honored to, to present here the, the uh, international business and international uh, potential investors, not potential because we already have invested more than 12 billion US dollars in, in ASEAN countries in our businesses, which is uh, uh, energy, electricity, natural gas, and, and water. Um, <clears throat> I consider that the ASEAN countries have um, all the assets to become one of the pillars of the, the global economy. Um, you have uh, human capital, human resources, 600 million people. You have uh, growth, um, uh, 2 trillion of GDP. Um, you have natural resources. Um, you have to, to face, I would say, uh, four main challenges. The um, economic sustainability uh, challenge, the uh, environmental challenge, the energy challenge, and the urban development challenge. But I'm, I'm sure you, you can uh, face all those challenges. <clears throat> the first one is um, the economic sustainability uh, challenge. Um, you, you, the single interior market is really a fantastic opportunity if you, you can do it in uh, 2015. Um, but you, you, you have to avoid to transform it into a fortress. You have to <clears throat> let it open to the, the rest of the world, uh, both in terms of trade, but Pascal Lamy has already mentioned, and also in terms of investment. The, um, in terms of uh, economic sustainability, you also have to uh, avoid the European and US mistakes uh, in avoiding um, uh, to increase the public indebtedness uh, in, the, in, the, in the future. The environmental challenge is a, a very a strong one because of the growth of your countries. I would speak about the water challenge, water quality, uh, air quality, but also ab about uh, um, CO2 and climate change. The climate change is not a European or a, a US challenge, it's a, a global challenge, and therefore the uh, ASEAN countries are also um, partner in this uh, uh, challenge. The third one is an uh, energy issue. There is no growth without enough energy. And, and this is very, uh, very uh, important. And I think that ASEAN countries need perhaps not energy integration, but energy cooperation with the construction of uh, common energy infrastructure ne networks. Uh, energy efficiency will be also uh, a necessity for all the countries in the world. Um, I would like to say a word about um, the transition to green economy. Everywhere in the world we are speaking about uh, the acceleration to the green economy. My advice would be not to go too quickly. And also in that respect, uh, you should avoid uh, perhaps um, the what I, I consider as the European mistake, which is to go uh, in the direction of the green economy at any price. Um, if you want to keep the competitiveness of your economy, as far as you have uh, local resources, domestic resources for ASEAN, I mean uh, natural gas in Indonesia, in, in Malaysia, uh, coal in Indonesia, you have uh, hydro in uh, Laos, you, you, you have geothermal in Indonesia and Philippines. Oh, uh, don't go too quickly <coughs> to other renewables. Mm -hmm. you, you have your own uh, competitive uh, energy resources. And the last challenge, uh, in my view, 
is the urban development challenge. Uh, you have here already giant cities growing very quickly. You, you have uh, uh, Bangkok, uh, Singapore, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, and many, many others. So how to control the development of those mega cities and at the same time uh, to make them uh, respecting the air quality, the, the well-being of the population. This is a, a, an important challenge. But uh, I'm sure that uh, you will be able to manage all these challenges and to make uh, ASEAN countries and ASEAN as a whole one of the pillars of the global economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mestrelli. Uh, our final but not last speaker, Professor uh, Brassad. Now, Mr. Mestrelli has mentioned the four challenges, some of them being, you know, environment, energy, urban, maybe economic stability. Our two ministers have mentioned that their focus needs to be on the local economy, boosting that, the consumption there, but also looking ahead with uh, ASEAN, ASEAN connectivity, the economic community moving ahead. You have some observations on that, please. This is a region that has enormous promise, enormous potential. It showed remarkable resilience during a very difficult time globally. But it still has a long way to go to unlock that potential and promise. There are very many domestic challenges ahead. But in addition, the harsh reality that many of these economies face, given that they are small and that they are very open, is that there is going to be an increasingly uncertain and tremendously volatile external environment. If you look, for instance, at commodity prices, many of these economies are subject, one way or the other, to commodity price volatility. And I think we have entered an era where whatever the level of commodity prices may settle at, the amount of volatility is going to be enormous. Trade integration has worked very well for the region, both within the region itself and in terms of its connectivity with the rest of the world. But that, again, opens up the region to vulnerability. I think the third aspect is really the critical one that is going to matter, capital flow volatility. Now, this is largely a consequence of weak policies in the advanced economies. Life isn't fair. One would argue that the advanced economies should bear the brunt of the problem, but the reality is that the emerging markets, including those in Asia, are going to have to deal with this. So in this exceedingly uncertain and volatile environment, my view is there are three ways ASEAN can go. One is to try to disengage. I don't think this is a viable or tenable option. Many of these economies have benefited enormously from their trade openness and their financial openness, and the risks are going to be there, but they need to be managed. A second possibility is greater integration. And in terms of this connectivity, I think there are enormous benefits to be had by greater integration within the ASEAN region in a variety of dimensions. It is true that linking together more closely through supply chain connectivity poses potential problems, potential vulnerabilities, but again, those are risks that can be managed given the enormous benefits that can arise from this. Pooling international reserves within the region might be another way, not just of protecting the region from external shocks, but in addition, um, trying to buffer the region as a whole and develop domestic capital markets as many initiatives already in place are trying to do. So there is a lot that can be done domestically. One other thing that could be done is currency union, but perhaps that's not such a good idea these days. <laughs> the key issue really is to think about domestic policies, and I think going to the theme of the session and the conference at large, if one thinks about rebalancing, that is ultimately what ASEAN is going to have to do. Each country will not just have to think about integration, but how to develop domestic markets, continue with domestic reforms in order to make sure that the countries are buffered against any possible external shocks. Um, the minister has already pointed out that some countries in the region are apparently well balanced already. If one thinks about balance in the relatively narrow context of where GDP growth is coming from, whether it's from consumption or exports or investment. In China, growth is largely investment driven. In some economies in ASEAN, um, exports are still playing a very important role. But to my mind, what is really critical is not so much the rebalancing of growth, but the domestic rebalancing 
And there are two critical components here, corruption and inequality, which are <laughs> essential not just per se, but because they erode the broader support for reforms. In many of these countries, enormous progress has been made in terms of macroeconomic and structural reforms. And that's why they have been doing so well. That's why they have been so resilient. But so long as corruption and inequality, which together constitute a really toxic mix, give the common people the perception that the benefits of openness are really going to the political and economic elite, the support for much broader reforms are going to be eroded. So what I would argue for is greater connectivity with the rest of the world and within each country, greater connectivity of the population at different levels. If I may, ladies and gentlemen, I have a question because you seem to be in agreement here where the countries in the region, or at least certainly with Indonesia and Thailand, the focus will be on the domestic economy boosting consumption. My the question then is that where does ASEAN connectivity and integration go? Where's the priority? How do you find the balance? Because certainly, if the focus of countries in the region is for the domestic economy, what then with integration, which a lot of people are hoping will, further, will be further advanced and would help the global economy move around. I'll ask the two gentlemen first, and then maybe Mr. Lamy, if he's got any concerns, if that focus continues for a while. Thank you. Well, before I, <coughs> I would touch on the, the Bishai's um, um, <coughs> question, I'd like to clarify myself a little bit, that, um, and I hope that you all would <coughs> review your thinking. If about 20 years ago, you asked to come up with one word uh, that is most desirable, I would guess it's the word called growth. Then after a while, we felt that oh, um, the uh, unstable growth seems to be the situation. Then if we push again, uh, someone would say um, sustainable growth. Um, if, if I try to ask you and ask myself uh, what exactly I would hope for uh, this day, would that still be growth or sustainable growth? I might say perhaps no. I would say uh, the word that is most desirable for me is the word balance. Um, I think you know, several years ago, um, Premier Wen Jiapao of China uh, gave a speech and uh, he said uh, the world and also perhaps you know, China and many economies around the world are suffering with the situation of the four uns. Uh, he started by saying that uh, unstable, sorry, unbalanced, unstable, uncoordinated and unsustainable. So whenever we, we see the situation is considered imbalance, whether imbalance in the external balance, you know, um, whether it's uh, the deficit or whether it's too much surplus, it's considered imbalance. Um, 1997, you know, Thailand started Asian economic crisis because of the imbalance in the external balance on the current account deficit. Now, I think you know, Thailand is another example we, had, we have been uh, enjoying uh, good uh, years after the balance after we picked the right uh, exchange rate regime. Now it seems to be uh, suffering with another side of the imbalance. We're suffering with uh, surplus. And the surplus, the pros and cons of uh, everything, right? Um, Thai baht gets stronger to the level, it's more difficult for the exporter to perform. And at the same time, liquidity pour into our economy, both in terms of international currencies and all local currencies. Then we would have to do something. So, if not only the government of a single country or economy would have to look at this term very carefully, I think at the global level, at the regional level, we have got to try to look at this word most careful too. For example, um, the problem in, in Europe these days is out of some imbalance. And if we dig into uh, <coughs> the grassroots of the problem, we'll find some items to be solved. Then, how would uh, the rest of the world try to work together with the West in order to bring the whole back, uh, world back into balance again? I think that's, that's very important. So um, I, I would say that um, we, we're not touching on the idea of uh, domestic consumption in such a way that we want to boost domestic consumption in order to achieve growth. But we feel that uh, we need to do something by not just uh, hoping that the uh, more, uh, the bigger um, <coughs> and the more important economies in the West would still keep being the buyers because now they're in a situation that they're suffering with the deficit. 
So it's our job to try to improve ourselves, to help ourselves, to help them too. And in order to, to do so, we need to improve the purchasing power of our own people. Uh, I mentioned uh, in <clears throat> some discussion this morning that we decided to change the name of Department of Export Promotion into Department of International Trade Promotion. Why? Because we still want to export more. At the same time, we want to buy more from Indonesia. Then someone asked me about the idea of protectionism. I said, why would we want protectionism? Because we want to buy products from Indonesia at the cheapest possible price. We are not going to lift any barrier in such a way that uh, would be harmful to the buyer. So I think um, that's what I, I'd, I'd like to mention on the part of Thailand to rebalancing ourselves, to improve the purchasing power of the Thai economy. And we have seen uh, many countries in East Asia, including China, Indonesia, improving <clears throat> the purchasing power of their own people. That's why trade within the region increased. That's, that's the situation. Thank you. Well, I think you raised the point on connectivity. I think it's, we're getting there. We're probably not getting there at the level that we might have wanted it as grandiose or as ambitious as we might have wanted it to be. But when you talk about regional connectivity, you've got to take into account the domestic connectivity within each country. And ASEAN is made up of countries and economies that sit on very different levels of GDP per capita and very different levels or different degree of social, economic, and political development. So again, I think if there is more realism and more reason within the idea of executing and implementing regional connectivity, we will get there but it's not gonna be as grandiose as we might have wanted it 10, 15 years ago. Now, peel the onion a little bit more. Within Indonesia, I think we're pretty clear-headed about where our problems have been on connectivity or domestic connectivity, and we're fixing it. We're not gonna be able to fix it overnight, mm -hmm. but I think the world has increasingly understood that Indonesia is capable of taking the little steps in the right direction. Fiscally, I think we're very, very sound. Monetarily, we manage inflation at 3.79% last year. The demographic bonus is what we always pitch to the rest of the world. I want to touch on Prasad's notion of inequality and corruption. On the, on the notion of inequality, I think we all have to understand that Indonesia has been very, very serious about complying with the Millennium Development Goals. The poverty rate has come down dramatically to around 12%, and unemployment has come down to a little over 6%. I think we'll be there uh, in two to three years' time in terms of where we have to be. Unemployment around 4 to 5%, and uh, poverty at around 7 to 8%. And investments, or capital formation, is taking place in a big way. It's been growing at 25 to 32% per year in the last two years, and deployment of capital to islands outside Java has gone, grown dramatically. Three years ago, only 18% of total capital formation took place outside the island of Java. This first quarter of 2012, 47% of total capital formation took place outside the island of Java. The more money we distribute, to the thousands of islands, I think the more we are going to be able to achieve in terms of addressing the issue of inequality. Corruption is a long-term game. It cannot be weeded out overnight. It took Hong Kong 30 years. And I always tell people that, you know, you take a long-term view of Indonesia, I think there is a growing number of people who agree that there will be fewer corrupt people in Indonesia in the next five to 10 years. That's the view taking. Salami, any observations before I, I open mean, it to the floor? I think there is no, I mean, this region is a very good example that it's not about domestic or regional or regional or global. It's domestic, regional and global. And that's the world we live in today. Yes. Uh, take just one example, uh, which is um, 
customs operations, which have a big uh, bearing on uh, whether trade flows freely or not. Indonesia, Thailand can uh, do individually uh, modernize their custom systems. They can move online. It's good, cheaper, yes. faster, safer, less corruption. So each of these countries individually should do that, and by the way, is doing that. Now, if they do it collectively in ASEAN, they will leverage what they do individually much more than if they don't do it regionally. And this then will create a sort of attraction which will bring more investment because like Jérôme Estrade said, if you uh, come to the region instead of coming to Malaysia or uh, uh, Indonesia, you'll invest more. And then the fact that the World Trade Organization is on the verge of adopting a big trade facilitation, custom modernization, simplification agreement yes. will help leveraging this to the rest of the planet. So these things now are totally connected with one another. Now, this is domestic, regional, global connectivity. And a country like Laopedia, for instance, who had not been in the World Trade Organization is nearing <coughs> the entry door. We had the consultations in Beijing when I was a few days ago. It's probably going to come. Mm -hmm. The countries of ASEAN has been, have been sort of helping, shouldering Lao PDR in this process. They've been helping it. It has worked. That's again a sort of regional result which probably hasn't appeared on the media radar screen. No. So it's, it's a combination, uh, and I don't think it's either or. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this stage, uh, just remind you, if, there, if does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists uh, in the issues that they've raised so far? If you do, uh, just please raise your hand, stand up. We have uh, people on the aisles there with microphones you can ask any question to any of the panelists. All we ask is that you identify yourselves before asking the question. So I'm opening the floor for now, and, and from this period onwards, if there's anybody who wants any questions, ask. Anyone have any questions before we move on? None so far. If I may move, gentlemen, to the issue of corruption that Mr. Prasad mentioned earlier, and Bagita said, it's, you, it's, you say it's a process, and we understand it takes time. Uh, you will appreciate, of course, that there are others who's, who are rather frustrated by it because when we talk about competitiveness and moving the region forward, there are various other indicators, whether it's infrastructure, whether education plays a role, and education takes a long gestation period. But corruption, uh, from a very you know, superficial point of view, I guess if you get rid of corruption, the sooner you get rid of it, the more competitive you become very, very quickly. Um, how would you view us moving forward? I mean, you say it takes time, but for how long? Mr. Prasad, you have pricked your interest there. Any, any further observations on corruption there before the two ministers uh, answer the questions? Um, it's very encouraging to hear about the progress in Indonesia has made, and I think it's a poster child for how if you start tackling these problems, you are unable to undertake the reforms and deliver the sort of performance that has been delivered. Mr. Lamy's uh, point is a very important one, that um, it's not really a distinction between things at the domestic, regional, and global levels. These are three important uh, blocks, but the foundation really is domestic, because the more you open up to regional integration, and especially to global integration, the greater the opportunities, but a lot of risks arise as well. And if you don't have a strong domestic foundation, it makes it much harder to work through. And this is especially true in the process of um, global integration because the reality is that when you open up trade or when you open up the capital flows, the initial benefits usually go to those who are able to take better advantage, who tend to be the economically uh, privileged. So this is where the corruption becomes a problem because if it's seen as something that's entrenched and that stacks the game in favor of the economically or politically privileged, mm -hmm. that makes it much harder to strengthen the domestic foundation. But I take the point that progress is being made. It's slow. I, of course, wish it was uh, 
um, much faster, but there are political constraints. It'll be very interesting to hear the views of the policymakers in this panel about how they think they can actually make progress. Three weeks ago, <clears throat> I was in Manila uh, to join the ADB meeting, and I heard very clearly that the <clears throat> President Aquino uh, announced uh, very clearly of the uh, battle against corruption and report a good progress of uh, what the Philippines government has done in the past uh, you know, few years, few months. Also in Thailand, um, Prime Minister Ying Lak um, announced very clearly with a workshop with those uh, senior officials and the civil servants to also declare war against corruption. Why at all you know, uh, these uh, leaders in the region are doing so? Um, but that you know, coming out from their own strong will, maybe, yes. But at the same time, um, voters hate corruption. So if, you know, democracy is very important to help you know, push forward the development in this area. And the second uh, thing is that um, in the last um, meeting of the BGO, um, we've got good progress. Uh, you know, we, we haven't really achieved the single undertaking uh, or the pro good progress in Doha round, but at least um, we achieved uh, some good progress that as more, uh, many as 40 uh, member countries agreed to enter into the GPA or in the government procurement agreement. And uh, that's another uh, progress that we have seen. Thailand, since now our government just stepped in and then we did not join the, the group, but uh, definitely in the next uh, meeting in the WTO, you will see, be seeing Thailand joining the club. So in a both uh, international, uh, I'm not saying pressure, but international progress, holding hands of one another, linking uh, economic benefit for those who agree to join improving the governance and you know, uh, courage from redu reduction, um, and also the um, benefit of democracy will help. Agita. Yeah. Look, I think, you know, if I go to the regions in Indonesia, to the provinces or the regencies or the municipalities, there's, what, 17,000 islands in Indonesia. The conversation is very different in every different place. Uh, many of them don't know what the World Economic Forum is. Many of them don't know what the G20 means. Many, many of them don't know that Indonesia is a member of the G20. The point I'm trying to make is education, I think, is a big part of the equation. Yes. And, you know, I see the glass half full in that at the rate that we have tremendous fiscal space today, our ability to spend a lot more money on stuff that's important to get us super educated in the next 20, 30, 40 years is there as long as we get our act together. This is a country that has a population of 245 million people, but with only around 10 million people paying taxes. And we're already allowing publicly listed companies to pay taxes, tax rates at about 20%. I see a future where I think Indonesia could quite easily conceive a much more competitive tax rate regime than Hong Kong or Singapore in the next 5, 10, 15 years, and also creating a much more bigger fiscal space as to allow us to educate more and more people. Now, how this relates directly to corruption, take the example of Hong Kong and Singapore. I mean, it takes very, very firm leadership at the top. I don't mean dictatorship, but firm leadership that basically shows examples that if you do bad stuff, bad stuff happens to you. And you back it up with creating jobs that pay, creating jobs that pay good. And you know, luckily I had the benefit of being in a private sector before. I make only $1,900 a month as a minister. My counterpart in Singapore makes hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Now you put <laughs> corruption in that equation, then it gets very clear. Sure. And I think it's a long-term process, and I do believe if we can create this extra fiscal space, I think we're going to be a lot less corrupt than we ever have been. Mr. Lam, yes. Well, I mean, it's obviously an issue on which uh, the solution is very domestic. 
And the best evidence for that is that some countries are doing extremely well, <laughs> others extremely badly. So the question is whether international disciplines on fighting corruptions help governments, at least those who have engaged political capital on this issue, does it help governments or not? Now, in the WTO, the answer of government so far has been no. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in WTO disciplines about anti-corruption, but for what the deputy <coughs> PM uh, mentioned, which is an agreement, which is a closed agreement between some members of WTO, which have agreed to open part of their public procurement to one another. Mm -hmm. There are obligations that have a sort of anti-corruption bearing. But for the rest, strangely in many ways for no, the layman, there's no rule at all in the WTO about anti-corruption. There is a UN anti-convention, yes. anti-corruption convention. <clears throat> there is an OECD code of conduct. There's nothing in WTO. No. And as you may know, we only negotiate in WTO what members of WTO want to negotiate in WTO. Absolutely. So, so far, this has been their collective answer. Ladies and gentlemen, I spotted the gentleman with the question back there. Two, one, one there, please. Right there, please. With the red tie, he's <laughs> waving his hand. To your left, Imtiaz, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Pichai. Uh, my name is Imtiaz Mokbil. I'm a columnist with the Bangkok Post. Uh, can I just follow up the issue of uh, mistakes that was mentioned this morning in the context of the currency union and the need to learn from that? Could I just ask the ministers from Thailand and Indonesia, as well as Mr. Prasad, what other mistakes does Asia need to learn from the experience of Europe and the United States and, and other countries in the West as to how not to build their economies uh, going forward? And perhaps this would also have some relevance to the need for, Mr. for the minister from Thailand and the need for balance that he mentioned. Mistakes to learn? Gentlemen, uh, three, three uh, the Deputy Prime Minister first, perhaps. Well, in my opinion, um, the world of uh, capitalism as we are in now, really designed by having some magic factors to help solve the problem of um, competitiveness. I say this without having intention to you know, criticize um, any decision in the past, but out of uh, the experience of Thailand. Uh, and that factor is exchange rate. And you know, please imagine that uh, what uh, would Thailand uh, be now, 15 years after 1997, without uh, this very important magic factor. Before we uh, badly suffer with the crisis, um, of course, there are so many uh, reasons why we uh, suffer, we fail, but uh, one of the important uh, reasons is because uh, we dollarize ourselves. We pay our you know, currency with dollar, and perhaps it stood at a too strong level to uh, keep uh, our economy to see external balance. We suffer with uh, huge current account deficits for uh, so many consecutive years. But after we pick the right uh, exchange rate regime, then float the but of course, painful in early days, um, we're now here. Out of the, the question uh, that you mentioned about US and Europe, if you try to recall in early 80s, in the United States, we've seen some crisis, property crisis, some states in the south like Texas and in the west, uh, California, they suffer with some problem. But if you look at the United States as if uh, there are 50 economies binding together, 50 uh, local government working together with single currency. Why at all uh, they can solve that problem? I think you know, the answer is because they share the same federal law, having the same certain government, and then there's no question whether the other 45 states would you know, uh, go and support uh, some states with uh, problems. But now what you're seeing in uh, Europe, perhaps um, they use the single currency, 
But uh, there's still some questions whether you know, some other strong economies should go in and support some economies that suffer now. So that's, that seems to be the difference. Um, that's why I'm, I keep saying that uh, I believe that the AEC, the ASEAN uh, countries and plus plus would work together as a very you know, strong economic community uh, supporting uh, the uh, global international trading. But um, um, we should not you know, try to go forward for having the same currency. Agita. We go back to 1998 or 1997, my salary dropped by 85% in dollar terms in two weeks. I was still able to afford a sack of rice for my family. Uh, then I think we had the benefit by way of the decisiveness that we went through of somebody telling us what to do. And I think Thailand is a clear example of going through the decisive phase, South Korea and Indonesia. Although we had it really, really bad, we couldn't pick ourselves up for a few years. I think if, you know, what we're seeing in Europe today, a little bit less in the US, is if we had the kind of decisiveness that we did have, you know, in Europe today, that we did have in Asia in 1997, 1998, things may be a little bit better. What the market participants are seeing is basically a moment of kicking the can down a road. You know, whether it's going to take one, two, or three years from today, we don't know. So surely, one journalist was kidding with me the other day, would things be different in Europe if an Asian would be the head of the IMF? I don't know. Yeah. But all I can say is, we want a stronger Europe sooner rather than later. We fear its weaknesses more than we fear its strengths. Very clear. Now, with respect to the common currency, I think you've got to go back to the earlier point of ASEAN being made up of different levels of economic development. There are countries that barely make, you know, around $1,000 GDP per capita, and there are those or others that make more than $40,000 GDP per capita. I think it's going to be very difficult without the sort of parity in purchasing power and all that to equitize currency, you know, in a near foreseeable future. If I could ask the two gentlemen at the end, Mr. Brassad and Mr. Mastrelay, what lessons from the question, what lessons can, this, can Asia learn from the experiences in Europe? Mr. Prasad, please. I think when it comes to currency union, the lesson from Europe is pretty clear. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> but the real lesson to be learned is that if you want to have closer integration, you need much better adjustment mechanisms, you need much better institutions. Um, in the US, for instance, adjustment works through labor mobility a great deal. Um, you also need fiscal transfer mechanisms that work well. So having said all that, one wonders why it is that integration still makes sense, because the other thing that many Asian economies learned in the late 1990s and um, important lessons that the advanced economies seem to have forgotten is that when you open up your capital markets, international investors, smart as they're supposed to be, do give you a lot of rope to hang yourself, and that can be potentially disastrous. So one might wonder, what is the point of regional integration or global integration? My view is that Asia in particular still needs a great deal of integration, again, not so much in order to get more capital, um, but really to accomplish this strengthening of the domestic building block, because what many of these countries do need in order to improve their resilience, in order to improve the sustainability and balance of their growth are better financial markets, um, more robust institutions, better corporate governance, and the process of opening up to capital flows, as I've argued in some of my research, is a very important collateral benefit of capital account opening. So it's not the capital itself, but what comes with the capital. So if you're able to assert discipline on yourself rather than letting yourself get carried away when international investors give you room, I think integration can work to your advantage, and that seems to be the path along which ASEAN is proceeding gradually. Lessons, sir. <clears throat> yes, uh, some, some perhaps uh, basic ideas about uh, Europe. First of all, I would like to remind that uh, the construction of Europe and integration 
has led to 50 years of peace and, and growth and prosperity for Europe. Uh, it's clear that um, the creation of a, a single currency for 17 uh, countries um, has been done. It has been also positive for several years, uh, creating a, a space uh, with no exchange currency risk and therefore has led also to expansion, but clearly having created a one single currency without respecting uh, common fiscal rules has led to the situation where we are. And uh, I consider that in Europe we need rather more integration, more uh, federal measures rather than less integration. Thank you. Sorry, there's a flash of question. There's a gentleman in the back there, please, and then the gentleman right here. Very quickly, please, we've only got five minutes left, but I am going to go over time in a couple of minutes, so please, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is for the Honorable Pat Gita. What do you know now you wish you knew before entering public service? Sorry, what was that again? No. What do you know now you wish you knew before entering public service? <laughs> and the second question is, what's your personal view on how to attract the best minds with the right heart into public service to shape policy? You know, your first question sounds like my wife's question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the first few months she was struggling, you know, in terms of how the hell are you going to be able to cope with all the stuff that you've never... Look, it, it took a few months for me to get used to, but uh, there is no regret, there is no remorse. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot more new things that I never imagined I would encounter. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that I've learned about public service that I didn't know. But th they don't necessarily mean that, you know, their reason for me to exit. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm happy where I am and the ability to make a difference, uh, to see unemployment rates come down, poverty rates come down, investments go up. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that uh, we're going to get hurt at times when there is bomb explosions, when there is tsunamis, when there is earthquakes, when there are moments when we can't explain why we did what we did, policies or policy postures that we come out with. And, you know, we've just learned about democracy uh, 14 years, and democracy took place. Political reform took place by way of the initial phase of uh, military reform. Uh, so it's only been 14 years that we've uh, learned to be a democratic nation. Uh, now, the second part of the question is that I think with what I have done and many others have done, they have magnetized uh, people from the private sector uh, within Indonesia and without Indonesia. Uh, to come back and uh, work with us, uh, making a lot less than whatever they were making uh, before. And this, I think, is good, because the more and more the younger generation uh, take ownership with what's important for the future of our kids and our grandkids, I think we'll be okay if you take a 10 to 20 year view. Thank you. Gentleman here, and then there was one question, yes please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Martin Craig, Pacific Asia Travel Association, PATA, based here in Bangkok. I think the ministers have been very generous in uh, commenting on Europe. Frankly, you could teach them a lot, and the message might be, no pain, no gain. I don't see anyone in Europe taking an 85% pay cut at the moment. Uh, my point in raising this issue is, from a travel association point of view, our members, many of your uh, leading job creators in the travel and tourism industry are extremely exercised about the fact that European governments are severely taxing tourists coming to Indonesia and Thailand. It costs over 500 US dollars to pay the UK government for permission to leave their own country. The EU is now trying to tax extraterritorially. I think you have the chance to speak up and perhaps put some backbone behind the European politicians, could you comment? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I was, I was a lot more muted than you wanted me to be because I'm sitting next to Pascal. And separately and privately, we've had a lot of debates about you know, the state of the world. That's all the comment you're going to get. Next question, please, gentlemen. <laughs> right. Could I have the microphone here, please? Uh, Sawadi, <clears throat> my name is uh, Tony Kailao from the Philippine National Oil Company. Uh, my question is uh, a bit rhetorical in the sense that uh, a lot has been said about integration and our topic today for this uh, forum is connectivity. However, very little has been said, and Mr. Lamy has touched on it somewhat. When you connect something like a chain, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. And it would be lamentable if you connect links that are very weak. So the thing is that to strengthen the links. And the second part of the connectivity is that once you have a connection like the grid, it will all depend on the quality of current or the quality of commodity that you pass through the grid. Uh, you can have the most elegant connectivity, but if you have, as they say, garbage in, garbage out. So I would like the panel to talk about these sort of the prerequisites for connectivity, particularly on the weakest links, and likewise on how to make a quality, the quality of information going through the connection. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that was more of a, a, a comment. One last question, we please. We have only two minutes left. There's a lady right down the back there in orange. Thank you. My name is Annalisa Valaris, CEO of Women's Sphere and a global entrepreneur from the Philippines in the US right now. My question has to do with your strategy for unlocking economic growth based on bridging the gap between the economic participation of women and men in your countries. Goldman Sachs came out with a very intelligent set of reports on women in the economy, basically positing that the key to unlocking economic growth, long-term growth and potential in countries is investing in women and in economic participation of women. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and strategy on that. Gentlemen. Yes. There's about 125 million women in Indonesia little over 50% of the population. And add to that the youth, another probably 55 million people. There is also youthful females within the first 125 million. These are the very people that will affect decision making on the economy, on politics, on social dimension. They have started in a big way. You can take a look at it uh, by way of the social media. I can honestly admit to you that my decisions are highly influenced by my wife and my daughter. Uh, and there is a growing number. Uh, last year we recruited about 60% of the new recruits were women. So right there you know the portrait suggests the future will be I think pretty filled with influences made by the female uh, part of the society. Uh, in the business-wise, uh, we probably don't have it to the scale that we see in some other countries, uh, but we're seeing champions and captains of the industries uh, rising up to the, the occasion, female champions. Uh, we have a ministry uh, strictly for women's affairs. I wish I was that minister, but it's run by a woman. Uh, it's specifically focused on empowering uh, entrepreneurship uh, in the uh, in in the small medium sector by the women, and it's I think if you compare where we are with you know where we were five years ago, I think we're a lot better off. But uh, you know uh, the number I think needs to be ramped up uh, a lot more. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have. Um, I would like to really take this opportunity to thank uh, all members of our esteemed panelists for their opening statements, their contributions. They raised quite a number of issues. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panel once again.
And thank you for being a great audience. Thank you very much. Okay.